Hello and welcome to Living Hope Church Online, brought to you by Living Hope Church Broadcast Media. I am your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Ilori, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. I'm really grateful to God that I have this wonderful opportunity to share with us something very remarkable from the Bible. The topic of today's broadcast is In the Shoes of Methuselah, Someone Like All of Us. In the Shoes of Methuselah, Someone Like All of Us. Please come with me to Genesis chapter 5, from verse 21 to verse 27. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. Methuselah is a very popular Bible figure. And for many people, they haven't got anything positive to say about him. So let me start straight away. Methuselah, the oldest person in the Bible and the oldest person in the record of the old world because he lived for 969 years, is someone like us. If you have negative views about him, remember Methuselah is someone like us. If you have positive views about him, remember Methuselah is someone like us. So today, let us step into the shoes of Methuselah. Let us see what we can learn from someone like all of us. There are other mentions of Methuselah in the Bible. So, 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, you will read as follows. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So that is to reaffirm to us that Methuselah indeed lived. Okay? So it's not just in the book of Genesis that you found Methuselah's name. Also, in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 3, verse 37, this is what we read. Jesus is being described here. His genealogy is being traced. So Jesus, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalel, the son of Kenan. So even the genealogy of Jesus was traced as far back even to Methuselah. This affirms the important point that Methuselah indeed lived. He lived for 969 years. That's a world record. But there are other persons who lived for over 900 years in the Bible. So let's look at this world record breakers. Adam, 
lived for 930 years. Adam's son, Seth, lived for 912 years. Seth's son, Enosh, lived for 905 years. Methuselah's grandfather, Jared, lived for 962 years. And Methuselah's grandson, Noah, lived for 950 years. These are world record breakers. Now I know for some people, they will say scientifically speaking, can this be their real age? I think it's important for us to say science clearly demonstrates that at the very early beginning, people lived far longer than they live today. Okay? But we are not going to be bound by scientific ratiocination. We are going to believe what the Bible says about the ages of these people. Okay? So when you look at it, Methuselah lived before the great flood. The days before the great flood are mostly a time of violence and wickedness. The world was in a terrible shape. Methuselah is the oldest man in the Bible. By the end of his life, the flood came. So you find out that during the time before the flood, humanity rejected their creator, essentially. Wickedness was rampant to the point that it grieved God that he had made the world, that he had created Adam and Eve. So before the flood, before God sent judgment upon the world, life was so bad, life was so horrible, human beings had completely rejected God. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, documents this for us. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah and his family, which by inference can include Methuselah, were the exception. So things were extremely bad. But there were also good people on the earth at the time. And God singled out Noah. He found grace. He was declared righteous by God. Methuselah was one of ten men who held prominence in the world after man's expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Methuselah was one of ten men who held prominence in the world after Adam and Eve were expelled by God from the Garden of Eden. These men, and probably the other people alive at the time, lived for centuries. They lived for hundreds of years. Let me give us the ten men. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. 
they held prominence in the world. That is, when you look at the story of their life, you can learn something significant in how people related to God and how they related to other human beings. In fact, due to the longevity of these men, there is an approximately 30-year period when they were all alive at the same time. Approximately for 30 years, these 10 men were all alive at the same time. Though Methuselah lived 693 years after Adam, it is very likely that Methuselah knew Adam because Adam lived for another 237 years after Methuselah was born. Like many people in his generation who were alive at the same time as Adam was, Methuselah would have learned about God, about creation, and about the Garden of Eden first hand. So Methuselah knew the Bible of his own day. If you are thinking about how was the Bible written, the Bible was first, you know, transferred orally from Adam and Eve to their children and to their children's children. People learned about God orally by word of mouth. They learned it in oral history before it became written down. People committed those stories to memory and they repeated them to their children and their children to their children's children until a time came when everything was written down. So, in his own time, the story of creation, the story of the relationship of God to man, as much as it concerned them in their own time, would have been known to Methuselah. One question that people have asked is, what does the name Methuselah mean? What does the name Methuselah mean? Well, those who think about these things, they agree that his name predicts the flood. That Methuselah as a name is a prophetic name. It predicts the flood and the destruction of the people and culture of the time before the flood, the antediluvian people. These are the people who lived before the flood. Although it is controversial in terms of looking at the exact meaning of Methuselah, and I will give us some of the meanings shortly, but all the meanings have a sense of foreboding, an ominous warning of destruction and judgment. So, what are the three principal meanings of the name Methuselah? First one, death of the sword. <laughs> Methuselah might mean death of the sword. Second one, when he dies, judgment when he dies when this one dies there will be judgment and the third one when he is dead it shall be sent when he is dead it shall be sent I'm focusing on the second one when he dies judgment because this is the nature of life for everyone we are all in the shoes of Methuselah. The Bible says it is given to man to live only once, to die only once, after this, the judgment. So each one of us, we are actually Methuselah. We have only one life to live, and after this, the judgment. So in a sense, we are in the shoes of Methuselah. 
What can we learn from his life? What can we learn from his times? Some people speculate that actually God allowed Methuselah to live long because God was giving Noah time to build the ark and an opportunity to repent. I like that interpretation. Some people, they speculate, they argue that actually God allowed Methuselah to live for 969 years because God was allowing the time for people to repent and for Noah to complete the building of the ark. That that was why he lived so long. Do you see why I say, in the shoes of Methuselah, someone like all of us, God is giving all of us time to repent, to come to him before the return of Christ. Because after we have lived and died, there is no time again to repent. It is time for judgment. So whether we live for 40 or 50 or 70 or 100 years or more, just like Methuselah, God is giving us the time now so that we can repent, so that we can have a great time with God through Christ Jesus. This is the time of salvation. There are also theories that Methuselah served as a priest or prophet of some sort because his name was prophetic. In fact, outside the Bible, in Jewish traditions, Methuselah is presented as a righteous person who served God as a priest. This is not found in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, but in Jewish traditions, in rabbinic traditions, Methuselah is presented as a priest of God, as someone who was righteous in his times. And that is important that we look at his name as predictive of what will happen in the life of everyone, men, women, children. We are given a span of time by God on this earth for one purpose only, not to build houses, marry, have children, and all that stuff that we will eventually do, most of us anyway, but actually to have time to repent and be reconciled to God. Now in our own days, as an example, in the time of Methuselah, it was through the ark provided by Noah. But now in our own days, there is only one ark of salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says there is no name on earth or in heaven by which anyone can be saved except the name of Jesus. You'll see that in the Acts of Apostles, chapter 4, verse 12. These are good background notes that I am grateful that I could share with us about Methuselah. Now, what lessons could we learn from the life and times of Methuselah? What lessons could we learn from the life and times of Methuselah? Point number one, as usual on this program, in this broadcast, Point number one, whether life is long or short, it will end one day. We must live with eternity in view. Methuselah lived for 969 years. It came to an end. It is not how long we live that counts. It is whether we spend our time here to discover the kindness the grace, the salvation of God in Christ Jesus. Methuselah is someone like all of us. 
whether life is long or short, it will end one day. What is important is that we must live with eternity in view. In Luke chapter 17, this is what Jesus was teaching in verses 26 to 29, Luke chapter 17. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built, but on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, he trained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Jesus is teaching us something very special. Of course, here on earth, all of us, we are going to be involved in things that pertain to making our life comfortable. Some of us, by the grace of God, we are going to have great careers, medical doctors, nurses, accountants, musicians, artists, you know, shopkeepers, bankers, taxi drivers, builders. That is the life on earth. Each one of us, we would need to discover what are the things that God in his mercy has placed in our life that will make us to go for one career or another. And in that career, in that vocation, whether we are Christian or not, whether we believe in God or not, it is in our nature as human beings to work hard, to succeed, to become famous, to become rich. It is in our nature as human beings to buy houses, buy land, build, marry, have children. It's in our nature as human beings that some will buy private jets, build houses, have mansions, they'll become billionaires and millionaires. It is in our nature as human beings that some people, when you look at their wealth, you might actually say they have got the whole world. What are they looking for again? They are so wealthy. In today's world, some people are wealthier than some countries. In today's world, as I'm speaking to you, so that is what Jesus is teaching, that everybody will be concerned with what goes on in the world here. But Jesus is warning us, if that is all you think life is about, think again. Because whether your life is long or short, whether it is filled with prosperity according to the way that mankind rates prosperity or not, one day your life will end. So whatever you are doing now, have eternity in view. There is a place beyond the grave. I know some people would say, when a person dies, that is the end. The grave is the end of it all. But we know, and we don't want to live in a fool's paradise, because so many people who believe that the grave is the end, and that there is no afterlife, we know that they are living in a fool's paradise. There is something beyond the grave. So when you are building your life here, in whatever way you are building it, acquiring properties, getting married, having children, getting two PhDs, whatever, whatever way you are doing it, have eternity in view. One day it will end. Don't let it catch you unawares. Luke 17, verses 26 to 29 again. Jesus is teaching here. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man when Jesus returns. And it is certain that Jesus will return. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage 
until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, he trained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Jesus asked the question, What will it profit a man if he gained the whole world but lost his soul? There is a place beyond the grave. May God in his mercy catch our attention right now. And there is only one Savior. Just as in the times of Noah, maybe there were other little boats, but the only boat that was meant for salvation was the boat of Noah. Today there may be many religions, there may be many opinions about salvation, there may be many views, but may God catch our attention. May God catch your attention. Jesus is the only one that God has given us for salvation in our own time. Are you eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building? Whatever you are doing now to enjoy your life or to make meaning for your life, remember eternity. Put eternity in view. It will help you to structure your affairs in such a way that when you die, you go to the place that God wants you to go to, and that is heaven. May God catch our attention right now. May we truly be reconciled to God through Christ Jesus. I've been a pastor for several years now, and what I have seen is that a majority of people, they only come to church. They never come to Christ. And sometimes, throughout their lifetime, all they do is church. They never do Christ. I want to encourage you. It's not about church. It's not about your denomination. It's not about how many people are in your church. It's not about how many people are actually serving God in your church. It's not about the music. It's not about the great preaching and teaching. It's not about the great quality of the building, the choir, the vestry. All the things that you might see as the pomp and pageantry of life in your church is nothing about that. It's about you coming to Christ. Are you in Christ Jesus? You will know when you are in Christ Jesus because the Holy Spirit will be in your life, changing your life day to day. You will love God exclusively. You will love your neighbor as yourself. You will begin to produce the good works that the Holy Spirit alone can make you to produce because he's living in you. I'm asking us, beginning with myself, have you come to Jesus or have you only come to church? May God in his mercy catch your attention to come to Christ. Point number one about Methuselah, who is like all of us. Whether life is long or short, it will end one day. How long, how short does not matter. But whether we live with eternity in view, Luke 16, verses 19 to 23. It's a story about the rich man and Lazarus. It's a parable that Jesus gave. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. So in spite of his poverty, he was righteous. The rich man also died and was buried. 
are now being in torments in Hades, in hell. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Of course, we all agree this is a parable. But it's a parable with an essential detail. There is life after death and you choose where you go now in the way you live your life whether in acknowledgement of God, in submission to God through Christ Jesus or you simply think mm, I can actually have Jesus and serve mammon so that your whole life is cluttered with what will I will eat, what I will drink, what I will wear all your life you are chasing all those things and you are actually asking for miracles coming to church only for those things listen very carefully life is not about eating and drinking and building and buying and selling the real meaning of life is that you encounter God that you give your life to Christ Jesus what I say to you I say strongly to myself, it actually begins with me. Let's move on quickly. I'm still going to spend some time on this very first point. Remember today, we are in the shoes of Methuselah. And Methuselah is someone like all of us. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 34. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Make the purpose of your life, make the meaning of your life, to be about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Come to Christ. When you come to Christ and then you go to church, that's a perfect picture. But when people go to church and they are not in Christ, that's a disaster. I'm asking you, I'm asking myself, have you come to Christ? Have you been to Jesus? Is Jesus in your life? It's not about any title that we carry. General overseer, bishop, apostle, uh, evangelist. You know, all sorts of titles that we can invent and decorate our lives with. Those titles are meaningless. What's important is, have you been to Jesus? Is Jesus in your life? Amen. The question I ask you is the question that is foremost in my life every day. Every day. What's important to me is being in Christ and Christ being in me. You will see it in the way you live your life. Listen, do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek and a lot of churchgoers do. A lot of pastors, bishops, evangelists, apostles, all sorts of fanciful names, men and women of God, you can look into their life and you can see it's all about wealth and riches and they will manipulate anything in order to become rich and famous. And even those who are not in that mold, who are not successful, in getting money through various schemes. They are just coming to church. They are being exploited and manipulated because they have been sold a story that their whole life, Jesus died so that they can be rich and healthy. And so they begin to chase all the things that unbelievers chase. And those things become the key aspects of their life. And for those things, there is nothing that they will not do there is no scheme, there is no art that they will not practice. So I'm saying to you, look at your life. Look at my life. Let me look into my life. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? 
what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek, churchgoers seek, apostles, men and women of God. This rat race is common in their life. You can see it in their church. You can see it in what they teach. You can see it in their life. But God is saying to us, seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you as God desires, according to your need. We have to move on because time is far gone. Remember today on this broadcast, we are in the shoes of Methuselah, someone like all of us. Point number two, whether we believe in God or not, our life will follow its natural course of earthly pursuits. But that is not the most important point about life. So you can see point number two is emerging from point number one. Life will end one day. Look at the way you handle life. Point number two is saying whether people believe in God or not, their life will follow its natural course of earthly pursuits. But that is not the most important point about life. So you can see in Ecclesiastes, vanity all is vanity. In chapter 2 from verse 1 to 11, Solomon, the richest king in the Bible, talks about all that he accumulated, all that he acquired, all the pleasures, all the wealth, all the fame. And then at the end he says, vanity, all is vanity. Vanity, all is vanity. Although most people focus on earthly pursuits, the real purpose of human life is to get right with God. This is point number two. Although most people, if not everyone, they focus on earthly pursuits, but the real purpose of human life from the point of view of God is to get right with God. May God in his mercy catch your attention. Methuselah lived for 969 years. It came to an end. Remember the predictive nature of his name. The predictive nature of his name. After this, the judgment. That is the other meaning of his name, Methuselah. After this, after this life, the judgment. After this, the judgment. I want to say something. I'm grateful to God that I'm practicing it. Don't focus on earthly pursuits. Please. The real purpose of your life is to get right with God. Make the purpose of your life every day to be getting right with God in all that you do. In how you handle life. Just look around you. You'll see so many gullible people, so many pretenders. Don't be one of them. You know, sometimes I hear people being told, oh, you are poor or you are suffering because of some generational curse. And all these gullible people, they will go to those preachers, give them money because they believe they are poor or things are not working properly for them because of some generational curse. These are gullible people. These are people who are deceived and who are self-deceived. And so their focus is on, on what? Earthly pursuits. How can I be rich? How can I pay off my debts? How can I have a child? How can I have a girl child? How can I have a boy child? How can I have my HIV just miraculously cured? How can I have my marriage turned around? You know, all these emotional things have become a trap in their life. Earthly pursuits. Listen, the real purpose of human life is to get right with God. When you get right with God, leave the rest in his hands. God will sort you out. That's what God has done for me. That is what God has done for Living Hope Church. I am a very clear example that if you put into practice 
what the Lord is teaching us from the example of Methuselah. If you focus your life on getting right with God, God has many means and many ways to sort you out according to his riches in glory, according to what he has designed your life to be. Don't focus on earthly pursuits. The real purpose of human life is to get right with God. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say I have no pleasure in them. Today, remember your creator. Getting right with him is the entire purpose of our life. Getting right with God is the entire purpose of our life. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. That's the meaning of Methuselah. If you are looking at one of the various meanings of the name Methuselah, one of them is after this, the judgment. It's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Let us get right with God. Let us get right with God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 2, Paul the Apostle has this to teach us. We then, as workers together with him, with Jesus, we plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For God says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, behold, Kemi, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Get right with God. Methuselah is someone like all of us. Whether life is long or short, it's going to end. The whole purpose of life that we have now, just as we read, that some people have interpreted, that Methuselah lived long so that God could allow people to repent before the flood came. God could allow people to get right with him. The whole purpose of my life and the whole purpose of your life is to get right with God, not to buy houses not to get married, not to have children, even though those are earthly pursuits that we are all involved in. But focus on getting right with God and he will sort other things out for you. Amen. Amen. Okay. First Thessalonians chapter 5 from verse 8 to 10. But let us who, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. That is the nut and bolt of Methuselah's life. If you put yourself in the shoes of Methuselah, he's someone like all of us. He's teaching us something important here. Get right with God. Look at the example of Enoch. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah for 300 years. Enoch had other sons and daughters. All the days of Enoch were 365 years, very short. Enoch walked with God, and it was not, for God took him. That is what the story of my life shall be, by the grace of God. That is what the story of your life shall be. If we get right with God, listen, when the time comes for us to die, it is not death that kills us. It is that God comes for us and he takes us. Is that not what Jesus said in John chapter 14? He says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. 
If that were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, then I'll come and take you home, Kemi. Amen. Don't you hear it again when he begins to speak and says, you want to hear the voice, welcome, faithful servant. I'm saying to us, the time is short for each one of us. Whether we live to be 100 years or more, let us get right with God now. Right now. Amen. So Enoch did not die. Enoch was translated. Enos was taken up to heaven to be with God. He had the shortest lifespan on earth of all the patriarchs before the flood. But that doesn't really matter. What counts is Enoch was right with God and God came for him and God rewarded him with eternal life. May you be prepared for eternal life just as Enoch was. May I too be similarly prepared. Time is gone. Final point, point number three. Point number one, whether life is long or short, it will end, have eternity in view. Point number two comes from point number one. If you are going to have eternity in view, every day get right with God. Make sure that you are living for God. This point number three comes from point number two which is this, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Use all your resources, all your skills, all your talents, all your opportunities, all your health and wealth to be a blessing to the maximum number of people. That's how you lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Because a lot of us whether we are rich or poor, whether we are ill or healthy, all that we are doing is following this rat race. We are not laying up treasures in heaven. We are laying up treasures here. And despite the fact that we all see that when a person dies, even if you bury their whole properties with them, it's meaningless. They can't carry anything to heaven. And nobody actually buries a person's properties with them. How many houses would you collapse and bury with a person? How many cars would you go and bury with a person? No, what God is requiring you to do is to be loving and caring and generous. Don't say, I have no money. Whatever you have, use it to be a blessing to someone. If God has blessed you through one person or another, you too go ahead and do likewise. I hate it when I hear people saying, I don't have money, I can't give. Giving is not about whether you have money or not. Giving is about your heart. Giving is about your heart. Generosity is not about whether you have money or not. Generosity is about your heart. A person with a large heart will be generous. Generosity is the condition of your heart. Greed is not that people do not have enough. Greed is not that people do not have a million pounds or a million naira. Greed is simply the condition of their heart that it is never enough. They are constantly wanting more and more. Satan has grabbed their attention. Satan has filled their life with a certain desire that can never ever be satisfied for money and more money, for fame and more fame, for people and more people. Satan has grabbed them. The very thing that they could have used to bless God in every way, that is what they accumulate and sit on top in order to be famous, in order to be the richest, in order to have so much that even if they live a million years, they can't spend it all. And we're not even talking about all those people alone. We're talking about people who are chasing the shadows, who want to be rich, who want to be rich, who want to have more. Time is far gone. Matthew chapter 6, 
verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break, they break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wherever your treasure is, that is where your heart will be also. In 1 Timothy, we read this, chapter 6, from verse 6 to 9. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we should be content. But those who desire to be rich, they fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown them in destruction and perdition. May that not be our life. May that not be what happens to us. In Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 15, we see the parable that Jesus gave. Okay? It is the parable of the rich fool. In Luke chapter 12, it actually starts from verse 13, it ends in verse 21. Someone came to Jesus, saying to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And Jesus said to everybody, Take heed and beware of greed, for your life does not consist in the abundance of what you possess. The meaning of your life does not consist in how fat your bank account is, in how many houses you have, in how many cars, how many wives, how many children, how many doctorate degrees, how many this and that, that we all perish. When you die, that is the end. It's like when the flood came, Everything that was built by those people in those days, everything was wiped away. Death is a great leveler. Yes, a person may be the richest person, but when they die, it comes to zero. Their account becomes zero. They can't spend anything again. They can't drive the cars. They can't live in the big houses. They can't access the fat bank, bank accounts. That's why Jesus is saying, those things, they do not actually define your life. What defines your life is your relationship with God, your generosity, your care, your being honest, your integrity. Because you go around and you see people who call themselves pastors, church leaders, and they are greedy, they are avaricious, they are liars. They are manipulators, they are schemers, they are scammers. You just look at them and you see a lot of people who are fools and who are willing to be fooled, they will go because they are also chasing the same shadows. They are chasing the same shadows. Listen very carefully. Jesus is saying, your life is not defined by the car that you are riding, by the house that you live in. As far as God is concerned, your life is not defined by the fashion of your clothes. All of those things are meaningless in the account of God. So in Luke chapter 12, you read from verse 16, he spoke a parable to them about a, a rich man. His, his grand yielded plentifully. Then this rich man thought within himself, what shall I do? Since I have no room to store my crops, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Verse 21, where I'm stopping. 
So Jesus said, So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. He's not rich toward God. In Acts chapter 9, verses 36 to 39, Peter was called because a particular Christian had died. Her name was Tabitha or Dorcas. She lived in Joppa. And everybody wanted her to leave. And when Peter came to pray over her body, everybody came to show what Tabitha had done. They came to show what Tabitha had done, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Her care, her love, her generosity. She wasn't described as the richest woman in the congregation. She wasn't described as the richest woman in the city of Joppa. But look at how she laid up treasure for herself in heaven. Her care, her love, her generosity. Is that not what Jesus himself did? In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, we read that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good. So if somebody would ask me, Pastor Kemi, what are you doing wherever you go? If I, can ne if I cannot genuinely say, I go about everywhere doing good, what's the purpose of being called pastor or general overseer? It's the same thing with you. Wherever you go, are you doing good? Can you genuinely say to yourself that wherever you go, you are doing good? Your life is not filled with greed and avarice and malice and deception and envy and strife and tension because a lot of people this is what clutters up their life but Jesus went everywhere doing good so much so in John chapter 10 verses 31 to 33 Jesus said to the people who wanted to stone him many good works I have shown you from my father for which of those works do you stone me can you also say that in your church many good works I have shown you from my father can you say it in your family many good works I have shown you from my father can you show can you say it in your community can you say it in your workplace many good works I have shown you no a lot of people they have not got good works they have got greed they have got avarice they have got malice. They have got all sorts of schemes. So the Jews answered Jesus saying, For a good work we do not stone you. Amen. Let's be like Jesus. Let's be like Jesus. See what Jesus tells us. We, are sh we should be the salt of the earth. We should be the light of the world. Matthew 5 verse 16 let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Is your light so shining in your church that people see your good works and they glorify God for your sake? Is your light so shining in your family that they see your good works and they glorify God? Is your light so shining in your workplace that they see your good works and they glorify your Father in heaven. Listen carefully. Whatever Methuselah built, whatever he achieved and possessed during his long life, whatever he passed on to his children as their inheritance, the silver houses, the fat bank accounts, all ended when he died. All ended. Much more so, all ended with the flood everything was swept away I really want to encourage us Methuselah is like all of us today we have considered what it means to look at the life and times of Methuselah 
the topic has been in the shoes of Methuselah, someone who is like all of us. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit bless your understanding. Until another version of our broadcast, I am your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Ilori, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching this broadcast. God bless you. Goodbye.